Hello everyone here, Chris Capri, founder of Second Skies. This is the Ichimoku Cloud Report. And or the weather report, as it's officially labeled on the website, so I might as well go with that. This is a class that's tailored, centered around the methods uh, and the, the training methodology of the Ichimoku Club. Uh, just a brief history. Uh, it was developed early 20th century, um, but couldn't be completed because this country in Japan where it was being developed was kind of involved in this thing called the World War, not particularly the second one. And that kind of tends to divert attention to other things like surviving and not publishing indicators. So this indicator was actually published in 1968 by a journalist. And to me, I think it's a fascinating uh, methodology. It's not just an indicator like a moving average. Um, it's got a lot of moving components to it. And I think it takes a different perspective on the markets, particularly support and resistance. And there are many elegant features to it. There are many different components. Uh, and I'm going to go through several of them. But what I am, once I go through the basic components, and, you know, my apologies, we'll have to go through some introductions for those of you that have been in this class many times. But we will also have to, uh, we'll get into a really interesting subject, which is Kumo construction, uh, particular types of Kumo models that you will see, um, how it relates to kind of sentiment or how it really kind of gives you a good gauge as to where the market is. So we're going to be spending uh, the second half of the portion really talking about the Kumo. The first portion, we will be just talking about the basic clock construction to introduce the essential components of it. Now, before I launch into a litany uh, about the Ichimoku Cloud, is there anybody here that this is your first time, that you have never been to a class on the Ichimoku Cloud or this class? I think I'm the only Ichimoku Cloud person here who teaches it. But uh, is anybody here, this is their first time, really no introduction to it, I'm familiar with it, uh, it's totally brand new. Um, I want to know if I'm de-virginizing anybody here. So anybody that, <clears throat> first time, Amir. Fantastic. Welcome, Amir. PS as well. All right. Postscript, this is your first time. Cool Raul, you are familiar. All right. Well, that's a good thing. Luckily, I am too. And Michael E. New to this. All right, great. So we've got a fair amount of new people here. And... How many people here have been trading the Ichimoku Cloud for weeks, months, uh, you know, a while now? How many have you been wielding the power of the Ichimoku Cloud? Anyone here? Because there's many of you here where I recognize the names you've been coming for quite a while. I think I've been doing this for over a year here, teaching these classes for over a year. So we've got to have, we've got to have some people that have been using this for a while. Is anybody here that's been doing it? Forex Champion had a couple losses, but getting better. Okay. Jocelyn MC, still learning. Deshea is familiar with it. Forex Gump, that is a cool name. I really like that. And you're in Bogota. I'm going to be actually near you. Uh, using it for a couple days. All right, you are an inveterate Ichimoku Cloud trader. At, you've looked at it before. All right. Does that mean you've actually done it? or? Um, and J-O-E, J-Zero-E is new to Ichimoku. Okay. Nobody here that's been using it for a while? Oh, for you Star Wars fans out there, I find your lack of faith disturbing. So, anyways, well, let's talk about some of the basic components. And then let's get into the topic for today. I'm going to reset the Ichimoku Cloud because mine's tailored. All right, there it is. Everything above this line right here. In fact, I could probably dish out momentum so we can get greater visual here. I hate to get rid of momentum and CCI, but they're not part of this show. They didn't get the parts, the leading, the leading role. So this, what you see right here, in the black mass behind it, is the Ichimoku Cloud. Uh, the only intruder in this whole thing is this blue line right here. This is the 20 MA, and I keep that on any single chart whatsoever. But everything else here you see is the Ichimoku Cloud. 
the purple line, this white line, this red line, they're all components of the Ichimoku Kinko Hyo. Now, the main focus of the Ichimoku Cloud, its, its primary objective is to identify trending environments, or more particularly environments where the moves are going to be relatively consistent in one particular direction. And by using several filters, we can use the Ichimoku Cloud to actually identify those and trade those. Some other components of the Ichimoku Cloud is that it's designed to give you um, what I think is a more evolved version of support and resistance. It's not static, it's dynamic. Um, static forms of support and resistance would be pivot points, uh, Fibonacci's. Um, these are all Western methods. Um, to me, it's not surprising that uh, a form of dynamic support and resistance that come out of the East, different mindset. Uh, the view of the person who invented the Ichimoku Cloud, Koichi Osada, was that support and resistance were evolving over time. They were not lines in the sand uh, that just went ad infinitum. They were evolving based upon how the market was evolving. They were living, breathing entities. And so that becomes an interesting project. How do you create... Uh, support resistance levels for a market that's always evolving. Well, I think they were, he was able to do that quite successfully, and we'll get into that. The other thing is that you may miss the initial trend move, and Ichimoku Cloud offers you opportunities to get back in and trend continuation moves. But the main goal of the Ichimoku Cloud is to get you in environments where the sediment is clear. Not where it, when we're in an environment of equilibrium, but when the sentiment is clear. In other words, the order flow in the market is clear in which direction it wants to go and which direction it is going. And so that is the goal and function of the Ichimoku Cloud. It's also very good, some of the offshoots or offspring of the Ichimoku Cloud, is that it has become very good at detecting and providing support and resistance levels. Uh, very, very good at that. Very good at kind of telling you when swing changes are going to occur. Due to the nature of the Tenkin and the Kijun line, or Tenkin and Kijun Sun, that's what they're called, Tenkin and Kijun Sun, Sen means line. And they're also very good at using the Kumo. The Kumo is very good at kind of informing the, the trader when volatility is high or low, when the trend is strong, and when support resistance is likely to hold and likely to break. So there's immense amounts of information involved in the Ichimoku Cloud. I really can't find an indicator out there that really does all of that in one shot. Uh, some are close but not many. Uh, I think this is probably the, the most thorough indicator out there. And to me, it's not just an indicator, it's an entire method. So let's talk about the components of it, and then let's talk about the topic for today, which is using the Kumo in a more nuanced uh, fashion. And I, I, I like to be fashionable, except at 7 in the morning. All right, so the most important aspect of the Ichimoku Cloud, the part that I, that any traditional Ichimoku practitioner will immediately zero in on as soon as they pull up the chart, is the cloud, or this thing here, this blue thing, the Kumo. Now, again, any seasoned Ichimoku practitioner, when they open up a chart, they will immediately reference price in relationship to the Kumo. The Kumo is designed to represent support and resistance, not just in the present, but in the future. Now, it has 
actually two components of it, and the shading is just the space in between of it. The, this part here, this white line, is what we refer to as Senkuspania, the more nimble of the two parts, portions of the cloud. Senkuspania merely takes, I guess I could delete the 20 EMA. Sorry, Boyke. Senkuspania really takes the value of this white line and this red line. This white line is called the Tenkin Sun, or Tenkin line. The red is called the Kijun, Kijun Sun, or Kijun line. Senkuspania merely takes the two values of these and averages them out. Actually, it just takes a Ginsu knife and chops them right down the middle. And there you go. That's the halfway point. That is Senkuspene. Now, that's not going to mean anything to you now, but once I tell you what the Tenkin and Kijun line are, it will actually mean something to you. Senkuspene B is the less nimble. It's the slower of the two lines. Senku span B is paying attention to price, particularly the candles, and more specifically, the last 52 candles of whatever time frame you're on. If you are on a 30-minute time frame, then you're talking, what is that, 26 hours. So it will take the last 52 candles. It will find the high and the low for that 52 candles. And then what it will do is it will shoot a line 26 periods ahead, and that line will be the halfway point between the, the high and the low for those 52 candles. My guess is this is the high and the low. We're pretty darn close. Maybe, maybe not. Actually, it's probably evolved a little bit. This was a few candles ago. My guess is it's probably moved to something like here, maybe this candle. There you go. So in essence, the Senku Span B is giving you two regions or spheres of influence. The upper half and the lower half of the last 52 candles price action. So it incorporates price action with the intention of saying, okay, where has price traversed over the last 52 candles? And after finding out where the market has traversed, this should tell us where support, uh, how could we say, sentiment, and, or give us a general gauge of where the market is in relationship to that. If the market is above that, the market is above the Senku Span B, then it's in the upper half of that range. If it's in the upper half of that range, it's more supported by buyers than it is sellers. By default, to stay in that upper half, it will have to be. If it's below that, that region there, it's in the lower half, then the pressure is more in line with the sellers. By definition, if you've spent the last 52 candles carving out, say, a 200 pip range, and you're in the bottom 100 pip portion of that range, the selling pressure is on, at least for that particular time period. So it's very good at giving you an overall gauge or thermostat of where the buying and selling is. Very, very useful. That space in between becomes the Kuma, this cloud right here. OK. Now, the other components of the Ichimoku cloud. Let's talk about the white and the red line, and then I'll briefly mention the purple line, and then I'm going to discard it. Not because it's purple, I like purple, but we'll talk about that later. So this white line right here is called the Tenkin line. This Tenkin line is akin to a 9 period moving average, but not quite. It's basically taking the highest high and the lowest low of the price action over the last 9 period. And calculating that and giving you this line. A nine period, let's say, EMA is close, but it's not the cigar. Oops, a 69 period moving average. Let's make an easy color. So this blue line is a nine period EMA. And as you can see, the white is a little bit different. It's not as smooth, which is not bad, 
It's just responding to price. It's not trying to smooth anything out. It's kind of a a, a more authentic moving average because it's not weighted. It's not um, it's not adjusting variables for anything. It's just taking the overall price action, taking the gestalt of that, and it's saying, okay, this is what I look like in that form. The tanking line is obviously the faster of the two because it's closer to price action. This is also your first line of attack and it's your first line of defense. It's your, really your informant. It's that guy at the top of the mast kind of looking out for land on the horizon. And it's also that same person that's kind of warning you of danger on the horizon as well. So it's really the informer the of uh, the Ichimoku Cloud Trader practitioner. It's one of them. This red line is a Kijun Sun, Kijun line. It is the same formula taking the highest high and the lowest over the last 26 time periods, and it gives you this value, this red line. This isn't quite the informant that the Tenkin line is. However, it's very informative as a whole. It is more of like the, the garrison that you leave behind at the castle, so to say. And it is trying to act more on the defense than it is the offense. So the red line is kind of a further layer of exclusion. When that gets breached, then it usually means that the trend is in trouble. And that there's only one more line of defense, and that's the Kumo. That's the last bastion there. This is the, the two main components in terms of your attack and your defense and your signal activation. There is another line here. This is called the Chiku span. The Chiku span is merely a line that represents all of the price action over the last, uh, you know, whatever, however long time period and it shoots it 26 time periods back, or 26 candles back. And by shooting it 26 candles back, it's trying to tell you where is the line of least resistance. If the Chiku span, in relationship to price, if the price is above, uh, how could I say, if Chiku span, if there is no price above the Chiku span, then there's generally no resistance above it. If on a downtrend, there is no price below the purple line or the chica spin, then there is no support in front of it. So it increases or decreases the line of least resistance. I personally think it's unnecessary. We can see it visually. So why have it? One second here. I just got to take a sip of water. Those are the main components of the Chiku spin or the Ichimoku Club. Now, any questions on that before I move on? I know there are some new people here, so I just want to make sure I accommodate that. Can I repeat the Chiku span role? Yes. The Chiku span, the role of the Chiku span is to kind of give you an additional confirmation as to where the line of least resistance is and the strength of a trend. It's Again, a map for price action, but it's just shot 26 time periods back. So if you have a Chiku span, let's say that's over here, and you look into price and there's no price action above it, well, then there's really very little resistance in front of it, so the line of least resistance is to the upside. The same thing goes for a downtrend. If we're in a downtrend, and the Chiku span is down here, and you don't see any previous price below it, then you don't have any support in front of you. So therefore, the line of least resistance is to the downside. It's confirmed. To me, it's unnecessary. It's extra fat, um, which I still have a few extra pounds, so I don't know why I should say that. But it's unnecessary because we can see that visually. And because we can see that, <clears throat> I like my charts to be tidy and removed or bereft of all unnecessary elements. And so I just delete it. There are some 
people that say the chief use bin is the most important portion of the Ichimoku practitioner, but I, I really question them as an Ichimoku practitioner. Because almost every seasoned Ichimoku practitioner will say the most important thing that any Ichimoku practitioner will reference immediately is the Kumo or the cloud. First thing they will do is always reference the Kumo. And I'll confess, anytime I pull up an Ichimoku chart, my eyes just naturally gravitate towards the Kumo because to me, that has so much information. It's telling me everything. <coughs> It tells me volume and volatility. It tells me sentiment. It tells me whether there is a likely reversal or not. It tells me the strength of support resistance. I mean, to be honest, anytime I pull up an Ichimoku chart, I immediately reference the cloud to get all that information at a glance. And by doing that, I will sit there and judge, hey, is this a good signal or not? Is this something I want to take or not? And so, Good, it looks like I answered your question there. So I'm kind of spewing over into the topic for today, which really is the Kuma. The Kuma is going to take center stage of our discussion today. Because I want to really kind of talk about some of the basic elements of the Kuma in terms of what it's kind of pointing at, what it's hinting towards. And then I want to talk about a formation that's actually present uh, in both of these time frames here, in both these days. So on a basic level, a very generic Walmart level, the Kumo is kind of telling you when we're in a generic bullish environment or generic bearish environment. If price action is above the Kumo, then we are in a very generic bullish environment. It's an overarching statement. It's not a specific statement saying buy or sell. It's just saying, hey, if anything, we want to be looking for more buy signals than sell signals. If we're below the Kumo, then we're in a general bearish environment. In Forex Champion, you're kind of stealing my thunder. Um, I, that's actually one of my hot topics today is what to talk about when the Kumo is flat, because that's actually a very important um, subject and it's a common phenomenon. So you kind of read my mind there. I'm a little suspicious of how you knew that. So, yes, we'll get into that. So generic environment in terms of above and below, when we're inside the Kumo, I would call this a no-fly zone or a no-trade zone. The reason why I would do that is because if you think about it, we're in a general state of equilibrium here. You know, this, let's just think about the Kumo's composition. Senku spin B, this blue line, is representing the last 52 candles worth of price action. It's representing the midpoint of the last 52 candles high and low. So if it, if the Senku Span B represents that level and the Senku Span A is really taking these pseudo moving averages and plotting their acceleration or deceleration, well then the space in between is really kind of gauging the midpoint of both the price action's range and acceleration. So in other words, trading inside here is generally not advisable. It's generally not thought of as a good idea because you're trading in the areas of equilibrium. You're, in other words, there's no clear winner in the market. There is no um, individual, or there's no real individual bias in the market. Therefore, you're subject to bias on both sides. Generally, that's not the environment I want to be in. I want to be in the clearest environment possible. So um, anytime that price is inside the Kumo, I don't trade it, basically. Like if I'm looking to execute a trade on a 30-minute time frame, uh, and it could be on another strategy. Um, but if I reference the Ichimoku cloud and I see, hey, we're inside the Kumo, this is not the environment, I stay away, hands off. I look for a better cherry. So... On a basic level, it gives you sentiment. On another level, it gives you volume and volatility analysis, let's say, based upon the thinness or thickness of the cloud. If you think about it, to create a really thick cloud, you would have to have some sort of acceleration of price action in one direction or another on the Senku Span A. And the only way you can do that is to be moving definitively or strongly in one particular direction. So with that being the case, taking a look here, 
take a span A is accelerating. This was 26 periods back, so during this time period is accelerating. Volume volatility must be increasing in the market to push the market clearly in one direction. Anytime you push the market clearly in one direction, it has to be due to an expansion of volume and volatility. So the stretching of the Senku span A will, by default, generally increase the thickness of the Kumo. Senku span B will take a little bit longer to evolve because it's taking 52 candles, so you need a lot of candles to really change that. But the bottom line is, is that since the Senku span A will always outpace the Senku span B, when you have a thick cloud, that means that volume and volatility sentiment is increasing or strong. So this is very good at gauging volume and volatility. When you have a thin cloud, then if you think about it, there's really no change in the Senku span B as there is here. That means there's no change in the last 52 candles increasing the higher low. And as each candle progresses, again, there's still no change. So with that being said, if there's no change in the range and price section, then there isn't clear sentiment in the market. Therefore, volume volatility must be down. So the thinness or thickness gives us a volume volatility sentiment. It's very, very powerful. It also means that if the cloud is designed to represent support and resistance, then the thickness or thinness of the cloud is integumental to whether you'd be taking a trade or not. Taking a trade in the face of a really thin cloud is very risky because the support resistance is not clearly defined. It's weak on both sides of the market. If it's weak on both sides of the market, it's just as likely or almost as probable that the pair is going to climb or descend. So if you have that environment, well, then that means lack of clear direction. That means increase in probability that your trade can reverse against you. I'm not a fan of that. However, in a thicker cloud, thicker cloud, active, when you get signals that are activated amongst a thick cloud, that actually decreases the risk. It decreases the risk because of the thicker cloud representing stronger layers of support or resistance depending on where price is in relationship to it. And because of those stronger layers of support and resistance and the thickness of the cloud, volume volatility must be stronger, particularly in the direction that the market is moving. So a thicker cloud actually decreases risk, whereas a thin cloud increases risk. This can actually affect your position size. And many Ichimoku practitioners will actually adjust their position size based upon the thinness or thickness of the cloud. So very powerful information there. Now, any questions on that before I move on to the next topic? For champion, but there is a thin here, the thin cloud on the left gave a good trade. That's true. You got to remember though, the cloud is ahead of price. So when this cloud was forming, price was over here, and look what happened. The market oscillated, went up, down, and back up. So if you've gotten somewhere in that area, it's possible you could have gotten stopped out. So again, remember, at the time that the cloud happened, market was over here. Now, in terms of this cloud, yes, it's true. The cloud is thin. It's thinner. It's not thin. This is thin. This is anorexic here. This is bulimic anorexic. And so this to me is thin. This to me is thinner. It's actually a decent sized cloud. If this is the cloud you're referring to, yes, it technically gave a good trade, but you really didn't have to worry about the cloud in this case because by the time it actually gave you the trade, the crossover happened right over here. Market had already broken through not only the previous highs, but it already cleared the cloud. The point I'm trying to make is, yes, there are going to be times where a thin cloud will give you a good trade. Absolutely, that's going to happen. However, it's not about missing market movements and market price. You're going to have that. 
you're going to have, you can't catch every single wave. And just because a good trade happens doesn't mean you need to be upset about it being gone. I've been trading this market way too long to be upset about trades that are gone. I can't tell you how many trades I've missed. I don't think about them anymore. There's always going to be another trade out there. There's always going to be another movement. There's always going to be something else. There's always going to be someone else on the dance floor to me to dance with. You know, I'm not here to dance with every woman on the dance floor. I'm here to dance with somebody that wants to dance and dance well with me. And so, yes, you are going to have opportunities and situations where you will miss good trades on thin clouds. But more often than not, it's not a question of whether you're going to miss that. The question is more often than not, is the thinner cloud going to give you bad trades or lesser probability trades than a thick cloud will? If the answer to that is yes, and just letting you know ahead of time, it is yes, but I thought I'd make it suspenseful here. The, then if the answer to that is yes, then what we're really trying to do is align ourselves with higher probability trades. So, yes, there are always times where bad signals or bad environments are going to produce good trades. That doesn't mean we want to take them. Our interest is trading consistently profitable over time, not in nailing every single opportunity that comes across the board. Because we're in this for the long haul. So if you want to try and take trades with thin clouds, and to me this isn't necessarily a thin cloud. It's not thick like this is. It's thinner, but it's a decent sized cloud. To me, this size, when I see this size cloud, I take trades off that. It's these clouds I'm a little more concerned about. They don't excite me at all. So the important thing is, is that over the long haul, we have higher probability trade ratios, and we have reduced risk opportunities, and we trade consistently. That's the most important thing. So hopefully that answers your question there, addresses your comment there. It's a great comment though. Cool Raul. All right. What criteria do you use to determine that the Kumo is weak, thin, or strong, thick? Is it by visual or some kind of measurement? It's a very good question. It's an excellent question. The answer to that is mostly visual. Um, it, Kumo analysis is a very artistic uh, endeavor that you will take upon. It's, it's, it's hard to make it scientific. So, but there are certain elements that I'm looking for. What do I use to determine whether it's thick or thin? Well, I don't have a specific set of pips that I will sit there and say, okay, this is too thin or too thick. Because you got to remember, cloud construction will change over time. There is no absolute thickness or thinness. There is an absolute thinness, but there is not an absolute thickness that it can take on. And so, to me, um, it, it is a, that is an artistic component. However, I wouldn't really trade on a Kumo that is about 15 pips thick. That's basically telling me that my supporter resistance is about 15 pips wide. I'm not too inspired by that. Now, I don't have a fixed number of pips. Maybe I should. I don't know. I'm still, you know, I'm still analyzing that. My, my answer is more than likely no. But I will not take one that's 15 pips thick. Would I take one that's 30 pips thick? Possibly. It would depend on how it's constructed. For example, is it one of those things that's 30 pips thick, but it's rapidly shrinking? Or is it one of those that starts off 30 pips thick and is increasing in thickness? Generally, the best kinds of Kumos are the ones that have a, at least a decent layer of thickness and are increasing in thickness as time goes on. Those are the kind of Kumos you want. So one of the criteria that I will use is, is the thickness improving over time? If it is, that's better. It's a much healthier environment. If it's not and it's decreasing, that's a worse environment. So that would be one of my criteria. The other one is, is it kind of operating from a right side up or right side down? What do I mean by that? Well, is the Senku Span A on the right side of price? 
In other words, for an uptrend, is Senku span A on the top? If Senku span A is on the bottom, then I would call that belly side down. And to me, that's less optimal. Because if you think about it, price is up here, Senku span is down here, Senku span A is down here, that means the acceleration hasn't really caught up to price yet. So that means it's kind of lagging. So the answer to that is, is that I'm less inspired by an upside down Senku span or Kumo. So I look for whether Senku span A is on the right side of price or not. Other things I will look for actually is something that Forks Champion mentioned. Do I have a flat Kumo bottom or top? Now I'm going to talk about why those are interesting, but those will tend to have sort of a gravity effect upon Mark on the price. We'll get into that. So some criteria to answer your question, you know, not 15 pips wide, thicker is better. It's going to depend on the time frame as well, but I generally don't use Ichimoku on less than 30 minutes. So I'm going to need, you know, somewhere around 30 pips or better. Generally, um, stable or increasing Kumos are better. Decreasing are less uh, exciting. Um, Kumo crosses, where the Senku Span A and B cross like this, Kumo crosses in the direction of the trade that I'm looking to take increase the probability. Um, and flat Kumo tops and bottoms have information. Um, also, Senko Span A being on the right side of the price. Those are all important criteria. So hopefully that gives you a, a decent picture. Beyond that, it's very artistic. And I wish it wasn't so artistic. It would be easy if it was scientific, but... You know, trading is both art and science. Anybody who tries to tell you differently, they're telling you differently, and I disagree with that. If the market was all logic, if it was all scientific, a lot more people would be making money, but it's not. And so, that being the case, hopefully I've answered your question there, cool world. Okay, so now we have an opportunity to talk about, cool, all right, glad I did. Now I have an opportunity to talk about Forex Champions topic, the one that stole my thunder, which is flat Kumo tops and bottoms. If you think about it, it's pretty rare that Senku Span A is going to be flat. It's more probable that Senku Span B is going to be flat. In fact, almost 95 plus percent of Kumo flat when you have any sort of flatness is in the Senku Span B. So if you think about it, since you know the mathematics of it, why would Senko Span B turn flat? Any ideas? This is a tricky question. It requires some sort of lateral thinking. But what kind of environment would cause a longer time frame? No. But it's a good guess. Low volatility, yes. Low volatility means that there wasn't enough volume of volatility to push the pair clearly in one direction. If it wasn't able to expand the range of that 52 candles, high and low, that is, if candle after candle kept coming, and that high and low wasn't being breached, you're going to get a flat Kumo bottom. In essence, Senku Span B represents what? This is really tricky. If somebody can get this, I'd be impressed. Senku Span B represents kind of an equilibrium for the market. Yes, it means price is ranging. And during ranging environments, reversion to the mean tends to dominate the environment, meaning that the market is going to want to go towards its tendency, and its tendency is towards the normalcy, reverting back to the mean or towards equilibrium. Therefore, price is going to return more towards the center of the recent range that it's been in. And if it hasn't been able to break that range candle after candle, then it has a tendency to gravitate towards that flat top or bottom. And so when you see Senku span Bs that are flat, it's 
both advantage and disadvantage. It's combination warning signal that we're not seeing any price acceleration or we're not seeing any new ranges being carved out. So it's saying, hey, there's a chance that market will want to gravitate towards that. And look at this. Got pretty close. And look at it. It's going before right now. Now, I also think it, one of the components of why it's going there is because of this little green line. Daily pivot. So I think that has other impact on it. But it's basically saying price is not increasing or decreasing in terms of its range. Therefore, there's a chance for it to gravitate towards this Kumo top or bottom. Very powerful information. What that also means is, is that if price action is to break a flat bottom or a flat top, then that becomes kind of a more powerful Kumo break signal for us. Because remember, this is the 50% Fibonacci for the last 52 candles high and low. So if we break this by enough, we're essentially now targeting the 61.8, but we're also entering the lower half of that price action's range, which means that the selling pressure is slightly more dominant than the buying pressure. The more time it spends below the Kumo bottom or top, the greater that selling pressure will be. So flat tops and bottoms become very attractive to a traditional Ichimoku practitioner. They increase the opportunities. A really good example of this is happening live now in your yen, 30 minute chart. That just disappeared. Oops, sorry about that. Just made it larger and smaller. Hopefully everything's okay. So look what happened here. We break above it, which is not surprising. This cloud is not exceptionally thin and it's not accelerating to one side or the other. However, flat Kumo bottom is kind of telling us price should oscillate a little bit more. So price should oscillate to inform the ceiling. That's kind of what's happening here. Boom, 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 boom. Look at what also happened though. The Kumo bottom, zoom in, market went right to the daily pivot, bounced, closed just above it. And look what happens once market starts to, we break Kumo bottom and now we're accelerating past the daily pivot, threatening to close below it. So traditional Ichimoku practitioners generally don't trade the first break of a flat bottom or a flat top. They generally look for a re-entry or a further confirmation. The reason being is because if that flat bottom really represents a sort of equilibrium, then we're in a ranging environment. We're in a ranging environment. It's going to take a little bit more uh, legwork or a little elbow grease, as the expression goes to get it to push further into bearish territory or bullish territory, or more bearish bias or more bullish bias. So with that being said, I generally will wait for a re-entry or a retest of a flat Kumo bottom or a flat Kumo top before I get in. To me, it's a much better opportunity. And if, if it really is the kind of equator, then market, the market should gravitate back towards it. Now, FID has a question. Where is the entry point? 132.10? No, you wouldn't enter at the Kumo itself. You'd want to give it some sort of space. You know, generally on a 30-minute time frame, 10 to 15 pips. I'd want to give it a little bit of clearance. However, there's just one problem with this. You have senior daily pivot right over there. I generally am not a fan of selling above pivots. I like to sell below that. So I'd want to wait for some sort of break of that pivot before I really take advantage of that. And so hopefully that answers your question. Okay, great. We're coming up towards an end here. I'm getting the curtain call. And that's because we need to make space for the next speaker. So I want to thank you all very much for attending this class here. I want to thank FX Street for hosting this class. This webinar was recorded, so there'll be transcripts made available later on.
Um, but again, thanks to FX Street for hosting this. I, I, I've, I've taught classes at many different environments, uh, many different places, and I think in terms of an online place, they have some of the best quality classes that are out there. So I think they're just, you know, they're awesome. Guys. So thanks again for hosting this. And I want to thank you all for coming. And so I'd like to give uh, the names down the list. Um, Yushe, Rod, Ron, Tom D, JP, Boyke, AB. Um, Must, Breadmaker, nice. Forex, Bob, Cladius, Jenko, Zul, Ohioer, William, Joe, Michael, 007, Goss, at Jack1, Trader J, Jocelyn, MC, Ray, Fid, PS, Postscript, Sobe, Claus, Cool, Raul, Harley, Michael E, Alex, Forex Champion, Jackie D, Carl, Lance, uh, Mike, Pete, Splaw, and Len. Thank you all very much for coming. Um, somebody had questions about info about my work? Sure. My work, you can uh, find out about that at check out me at www.2ndskies.com. And if you have questions about my services, uh, feel free to info me at 2ndskies.com. We have trade signals. Um, I am now starting to again offer automated trading uh, that you can subscribe to. Uh, and I also do private education mentoring. Uh, many people don't want to spend years learning on their own. So you come see a mentor like myself who will accelerate your learning curve. And what takes you one to two to three years to learn on your own, I teach you in a month. And if that's interesting to you, then email me about it. Let's talk about it. So I love to, I love working with students. I recently had somebody who I've been teaching Nikichimoku Cloud practitioner stuff to. And he just emailed and said, you know what, I've been making money thanks to your, you know, your mentoring. So thanks a lot. And honestly, that's the most rewarding thing I could ever get is to know that somebody's making money due to me helping them become better. So that's what I try and do as an educator. So until then, I want to bid you all adieu. I will see you next week. Same bad time, same bad channel for this show. Uh, good hunting, good Ichimoku cloud trading. I hope to hear from you again. Until then, uh, I shall talk to you later. Take care, everyone.